episode of Surviving the Survivor. We bring you the best guests in all of true crime. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button. Here's your host, Emmy Award winning broadcaster, Joel Walton. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises to bring you the very best guests in all of true crime. And if you're having deja vu all over again, it's because Tim Jansen and I were on your YouTube screens <laughs> earlier today, and we are back at it. Tons and tons of news to unpack in these developments. Uh, of course, Charlie Adelson is at, is at the center of all this, the wealthy South Florida periodontist. He managed to elude justice for nine plus years. He, of course, was on trial over the last couple of weeks and was convicted of first degree murder a week ago, Monday. Uh, his sentencing is set for 12 12, December 12th. And uh, he is expected to serve the rest of his natural life in state prison unless. He cops some sort of deal, and we'll ask our attorneys about the possibilities of that and who, if anyone, uh, Charlie might flip on. And then, of course, uh, as we know by now, and to coin a phrase, it looks like the puzzle pieces have fallen into place and are continuing to fall into place here. Donna Adelson arrested exactly one week after her little son, Charlie Adelson, was convicted last night. Donna Adelson intercepted by FBI agents at Miami International Airport, just about a 20 minute ride from where I sit. And uh, she spent the night at a place called Turner Guilford Knight Correction Center, a place I wouldn't wish on my own worst enemy. Thankfully, I've never spent time there. But as a reporter <laughs> twice in Miami, I've covered many stories there. I've been inside the jail. It is not a place that you want to even spend a single night in. Of course, we've got our very, very best guest to discuss this all. Dave Arenberg is going to be joining us in about 13 minutes. He got caught in some rain here. He is the Florida state attorney for Palm Beach County. He was also a former member of the Florida Senate, elected to the Senate back in 2002 as its youngest member. And that's where he got to know uh, FSU law professor Dan Markell. So the two of them are friends. This is personal to him, but of course, Dave Arenberg, again, a Florida state attorney out of Palm Beach County. Next up, you've got the famed Tallahassee defense attorney. Keep calm and carry on. Tough to do for the Adelsons these days. That's what the sign behind Tim Jansen says. He's a criminal defense attorney uh, with a law firm that bears his name, Jansen and Davis. He also spent five years as a federal prosecutor. No one knows Tallahassee better than Tim Jansen, but another guy who knows it very well. We'll get to him in a moment, but ladies first, Terry Austin. Uh, she is a Columbia Law School trained attorney, and she is the host and legal analyst at the Law and Crime Network, which is run by my old employer, Dan Abrams, who I do love dearly. The guy is a very smart man running um, a great shop there. So uh, great to have Terry Austin back. And last but not least, Jeremy Mutz. Uh, he is an author, but he's also an attorney specializing in criminal defense, family law, and divorce law. He was at one time in the prosecutor's office in Tallahassee, so he has a lot of insight into what goes on there. And he's now in private practice in Chipley. And then joining us at 5.30 tonight, Charlie Adelson's former best friend, Ryan Fitzpatrick. He's going to come on. He testified in this most recent case he will be here. He knows Donna. He knows Charlie. And he's got some things to say. Without further ado, Tim Jansen, you've been the MVP of STS on this, uh, hearing from people around the world about the commentary uh, that you've dished out on this. 99% loving you, but not everyone, Tim Jansen, because uh, you're not you're not 100% convinced about uh, an indictment coming Wendy Adelson's way, which we'll get into in a moment. But the charges, Donna Adelson arrested last night mm -hmm. and like mother, like son, the exact same charges, charges of first degree murder, conspiracy and solicitation in that 2014 murder for hire killing of Dan Markell, that FSU law professor. Before I toss it to you, Tim, special shout out to Ruth Markell 
Phil Markell, Shelly Markell. I've been in touch with the family members, uh, wishing them nothing but the best. Uh, as you can imagine, the emotion for them is probably too much to bear. Nine plus years, and finally, finally, they're seeing these puzzle pieces fall into place. But Tim Jansen, these charges are as serious as they get, aren't they? Yep. Uh, co-conspirators usually end up with the same charges as the co-conspirators. So Charlie was charged with murder, solicitation, and conspiracy. Same with the mom. Um, if you look at the evidence in this case, it looks like the mom was the driving force for all this thing to start. Charlie didn't give a crap really about Wendy. She didn't care. I mean, he might have cared about the grandkid, but he was living a fast life in Miami. He had fast cars, fast women. And mama was complaining about what's going on up north, which really is the south to us. Um, and they did something about it. And what they did was they hired Magbanoa, got Garcia. They tried to insulate themselves with a buffer. That buffer broke. The dam broke. Charlie had his trial. During that trial, all this evidence came in that points right at Donna. So now the community sees all this evidence against Donna. And now the state attorney's like, wow, we better do something. But lo and behold, they get wind that Donna's going to Vietnam one way. So FBI intercepted her. I like the fact what, I, what I'm hearing is they waited till she walked down the tarmac so she can't say she was turning or not going to go. And so she probably felt like, I'm free. I'm getting on the plane. And then FBI comes in while those people are behind her. That must have been a surreal moment for her to get handcuffed and walked out. And Harvey, what did he do? Did he go sit on his plane or did he go with her? It's crazy. That, that's a $64,000 question. There are so many layers of this Um proverbial onion to unpeel. We're going to get to it all over the next probably hour and a half, two hours. Um, but this is just a real tragic case, Terry Austin. And this comment right here, right off the bat, I always say best guess, no offense to our best guess, but better community. I had STS today sending me documents, sending me videos. By the way, there's got to be video of Donna's arrest um, unless they shuffled her to a quiet area because this was right as a plane was boarding. Uh, if anyone happens to find that video, surviving the survivor at gmail.com, STS Nation is the best resource for true crime out there. And I uh, would love to see that. Um, Julie here, though, uh, Terry, to you. All Donna had to do was let her son in law, Dan Markell, breathe. Now it looks like she'll be locked away. Wonder if Charlie Adelson will turn on her before sentencing. There's so many possibilities of which way this can turn. But just at its core, the irony is so incredibly thick. Uh, Charlie Adelson is now in Tallahassee awaiting sentencing, and his mother is about to be shipped up there, the exact same place they wanted their grandchildren to flee from and their daughter to flee from. What were these guys thinking? You know, it is the irony of all ironies, and all they did have to do, as your writer says, as Julie says, is, you know, let her son-in-law have some freedom here. Let him see his children. And the fact that Donna truly may have been the one behind this whole thing, I think the prosecution, Georgia Koppelman, you have to give her some credit. The way she went after these defendants, first she had you know, the trigger man or the hired gunman, he's the one who said, look, all of these individuals are involved. Rivera was the one who turned on everyone. They got Garcia, they got Catherine McBadema, and then it all pointed to Charlie Adelson. And if you listen to the way Kappelman set up the case against Charlie Adelson, she was pointing the finger at that time towards Donna. She said, look at these emails. Donna was the one who wrote to Charlie and said, please intervene here. Donna was the one who literally wrote to Wendy and said, you need to be tough. So I think she had her eyes on Donna from the very beginning. What I'm wondering here and what I think all your viewers will probably be wondering is, who is next? Is Harvey getting away with everything? Can they bring him in? What's going to happen to Wendy? She has use immunity, which doesn't mean she's completely immune. Maybe if they have additional outside 
information or evidence, they can go after her as well. I doubt it. It doesn't seem as though they will. But I definitely think Kappelman, at the end of the day, knew what she was doing. It was an excellent strategy. And Tim has some great sources in Tallahassee, and he contacted me, which is why we went on the air earlier, because there are reports that Wendy has been contacting attorney an attorney in the uh, greater Atlanta metro area who's an expert in Castigar. We're going to get to that in just a little while. Um, but, you know, there's such a human element to this story, not just a legal one. Jeremy, um, do me a favor. Remind the audiences, the audience of the books that you have written, the two titles, and try to field this question if you can, and then we'll get back to some of the legal aspects. But Laura Quigley here says, how do these two, Don and Charlie, explain to grandchildren that they were running from the police for killing their father? I mean, it's so tragic. These kids are one's a young teen, one's about to become a young teen. They're old enough. They're very smart boys to figure all this out. Um, absolutely tragic. Jeremy, how would you answer this? But first, just remind everyone of the titles of your two books that are out. Well, thank you for having me, Joel. And it's great to be on with Tim and Terry. The books I wrote were The Chance I'll Take. It's a murder mystery I wrote in 2014. And then the second one was Don't Call It Murder, uh, which I published in 2021. And I wrote those books not meaning to be prophetic, um, but sometimes life has a way of imitating art. And so I wrote that in 2014. And then I lived through uh, the events in this case back in 2016. And then uh, I wrote the second book that was kind of almost like a an outlet for some of the things I saw with this case and some of the things I saw with, with other unsolved cases in the, in the Tallahassee area. But to answer the question though, the only way they can answer that is with more lies. I'm afraid they're going to lie to the children. They're going to continue to try to manipulate the children to keep them on, on board and with the narrative that they've, they've spun all these years, unfortunately, um, the thing, though, that goes in those children's favor is obviously they have two smart parents, uh, Dan and Wendy. I would expect those two boys are very smart young men, and they're going to see the, the truth one day. If not in the near term, certainly one day they're going to understand they had a, a loving father that was taken from them. Uh, they're going to understand that, you know, all these years this effort was made to achieve justice. Um, and I think going back to 2016, when I first started, you know, commenting about the case, um, you look at something like this happening in a city, it just cannot stand. And I think what we saw last week and now it just shows that here's a, a state attorney's office and here's professionals in law enforcement working together to make sure that doesn't stand. And we get justice for for that and, and not just allow somebody to come in and, and hire a murderer in, in your city. You know, if, if you do that, you can't really. You can't really be a, a prosecutor or a police chief or anything like that. You might as well hang it up if you let that happen. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad we're we're to that point now that it's not going to stand. Uh, Jeremy, always thoughtful. Um, Teresa, I stand corrected. I thought it was 12 and 13, 13 and 14 kids do grow up fast. So two teenagers. Um, Tim Jansen begs the question where the hell is harvey right now we really don't know no one knows did he get on that plane did he not get on that plane of course it was headed to dubai uh and then ultimately on to vietnam um but jacqueline here says harvey is guilty to tim jansen hate to put you on the spot but i will what do you think of harvey well my guess is harvey did not get on the plane because i was contacted too quickly to find out that she had been arrested at the airport. So Harvey must have started making phone calls because once she goes into custody, they're not letting her make a phone call. They're securing her, uh, depending on who did the arrest, if Sanford was there or if the local law enforcement took her to a room and then they arrested her. Um, so I don't believe Charlie got on the plane. I don't know what happened to his bags. They probably, they probably did go to, they probably wouldn't have. They won't allow him to go to, you don't get on the plane. Um, we know very little about Harvey. We have one tape recording at the Monsu, that sushi restaurant, really hard to hear what is being said. You don't know of what's being said. If they're telling him after all the events have occurred, could he be an accessory after the fact? I don't know what he did. Um, after that, that would have been considered an accessory. I think he may know, but I don't think there's any evidence that 
the state attorney has that they can present to charge him. Uh, if they did, they probably would have charged him because if they knew she was leaving, they probably knew they were traveling together and they released him. So I think Harvey's, I don't know for sure, but I would say they have the least amount of evidence on Harvey. And my mom uh, from day one has said that uh, Harvey is complicit in this. Will be, It will be interesting over time to see if that is true. Uh, there is a, a new PCA or probable cause affidavit with new information about Donna released since her arrest. And we're going to get into that in a moment. But as I said, Jeremy Mutz was on the inside of this SAO, the state attorney's office in Tallahassee. Um, the question here from Rabia does Charlie know that Donna has been arrested? We were asking this question last night, Jeremy, when this news broke and we were live on the air with Tim. By this point, you got to assume that news travels through the Leon County Jail. Do you think he knows by now that his mother uh, is in custody in Miami-Dade County? I do. I think he's received phone calls. Um, they're also allowed emails. So I, I think he's he's had word by now. And knowing what you know of him, uh, you know, you're a, you're a writer too, not just an attorney. What do you think psychologically is going on in his mind if you take off your lawyer hat and put on your author hat for a moment? You know, this is like part four of a really crazy novel. And, you know, we're into this final part with somebody fleeing, potentially fleeing to Vietnam. He's facing down life in prison with his sentencing on the 12th. And his mother gets arrested that actually he's been talking to every single day, apparently, from what from what I hear. So it's a big shock. I mean, I think he's probably a very lonely man at this point. And, uh, you know, for somebody who's kind of the was sort of the consummate extrovert and playboy drove a Ferrari, enjoyed really everything that the best of everything that his profession and his income could purchase for him to now be in that eight by 10 cell. Um, you know, it's hot in the summer, cold in the winter in the Leon County jail. It's not a very nice place. I, the times I visited there for work, that smell is still in my nostrils. I can tell you exactly what it smells like. Um, he's not in a great place. Although, despite saying that, I don't think he's going to flip. You know, I said before this last trial, you know, is he going to flip? Is he going to work out a deal? I just don't see it. I don't think I don't think so. I think there were some maybe some hint by charging yesterday. Were they trying to get in before sentencing and put some pressure on him? But I don't think so. I think that was just purely based on they didn't want them to flee to a place that would be it would be like the Bataan Death March to get her back from Vietnam. That is for, for damn sure. It'd be very hard. Colleen says Harvey had to know that money was going out to pay the hitmen. Uh, and then this question, I'll be the judge. Dave Arenberg, the Florida state attorney out of Palm Beach County, who is friends with Dan Markell and uh, lived up in Tallahassee. As the youngest state senator, um, this question here, I'll be the judge. Harvey going to the airport, can that be used against him as well? Harvey paid for this. There's no way Donna gets this money without Harvey approving. You're coming in, obviously. Dave, we haven't gotten to the meat and potatoes today, but somehow we got onto the subject of Harvey. Uh, do you think he's complicit in this? Is there enough, in your opinion, to eventually get to him, Dave? Was there a ticket for him to go to Vietnam? I assume so. Yeah. As yeah. far as we know, yes. Well, yeah, well, if Harvey's ever charged, that could come back to be used against him as consciousness of guilt. It's going to be used against Donna, uh, but they're not going to charge him for uh, for fleeing unless he's going to be charged for the underlying crime. I think what they're going to do is they're going to go after Donna. She's the lowest hanging fruit, and then they'll see what shakes out, and then Harvey and Wendy could be next. But I think they're this is the pattern in the state attorney's office up in Leon County, and Jack Campbell's doing a great job. Some offices would have charged all of them at once. Instead, they go piece by piece, and it's been working. And so if, if this doesn't mean Harvey's out of the woods by any means, just means that they've got the goods on Donna clearly. A uh, case to remember here. We're going to get to this in a moment, but just so STS Nation knows, do you think Donna's calls with Charlie dis discussing suicide is her plan to fake, was her plan to fake her suicide in Vietnam? We're going to tell you what that's all about in a moment. But Terry, I'm just still hung up on how devious this plan was. You know, we hear about murders all the time. Uh, there was a case out in the Midwest. There was just a conviction today. A woman who now is convicted of putting Visine eye drops into someone she was caring for. 
Uh, she was convicted today. So we're constantly hearing these sort of larger than life stories. But in your opinion, your estimation, why is this? I mean, this story is just so uh, extra convoluted. Um, it just layers of this family basically targeting an innocent family. Why do you think it's kind of grabbed the attention, not just of uh, people here in the States, but around the world? Well, I think, first of all, Joel, we have a victim, Dan Markell, who was loved. He was an FSU law professor. He was well-liked by his students, by his colleagues. He was a bright man, as we've said before, and he's the father of two young boys. So I think when people see a victim like that, it makes them feel as though, oh, my gosh, what did he do wrong? Where did he go wrong? What did he say wrong? And in fact, he didn't do anything wrong. He basically was trying to see his children and to have a divorce that didn't end up in his death, obviously. And I think the other issue here is you have this entire family and you mentioned it. You have Donna, who is the mother. You have Harvey, who is the you know, father of these children who are privileged. I mean, there's no question that Wendy and Charlie are privileged children. They are accustomed to having what they want in life. And Charlie was the one who was guiding Wendy. No, don't buy that house. Don't move out of the area. Make sure you stay with us, the family. And ultimately, I think the world is seeing this entire family as against one individual who is just trying to save his children from, you know, being brainwashed by these individuals who want nothing but to have the kids with them. And then you add the layer of hiring people to do this. And the way the murder was conducted, it was a brutal shooting. And he was in his own yard, in his driveway, going home. And I think people look at that and they say, it's just a horrible way to die. And it didn't have to be this way. It could have easily been worked out and, you know, saved a life and saved the father of these two kids. So it's just a tragedy. Well said. Someone said that they could have afforded to just fly Wendy and Dan down private if they needed to and spend instead of spending all this money now on uh, trips to Dubai, Vietnam and uh, on defense attorneys. Tim Jansen, I hate doing this to you because uh, you're such a friend of the show, but uh, Amanda wants to know, <laughs> would, you, <laughs> would you represent, for those who don't know Tim, and that's no one who's been watching this show because he's on all the time and provides some of the most enlightening commentary, but uh, Tim is one of the best known criminal defense attorneys in Tallahassee. What if you got a call from the Adelsons right now, Tim? Um, personally, I would not go back. I like the guy a lot, Daniel Rashbaum, but if it was me... I'd want a Tallahassee attorney. What would you say to them? Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, my representation. Um, I think if they watch this show, they have seen that I've, I've felt that she's had a lot of liability and a lot of incriminating evidence against her. Um, clearly, the way that she's handled this, it's not the kind of client you want who's really ready to flee or commit suicide. Uh, so I would say that's not going to happen. Um, I don't expect it to happen. And if it did happen, um, if it did happen, I'll be very rich. Uh, put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's an upside to everything. A silver lining and everything. Um, Dave Arenberg, this is sort of your world, I think. Did Don and Harvey apply for visas for Dubai and Vietnam? And when is that something that the state attorney's office is going to look into? I mean, just, just the fact that they were leaving and you have the recordings that say i'm looking into countries where there's no extradition <laughs> and then they fled i mean you don't need to worry about the visa stuff like she's clearly trying to flee that's going to be used against her in trial she's being charged as a principal for first degree murder so all the stuff about aiding and abetting all this stuff that, that's that's small potatoes yeah. just f focus on the big picture here first degree murder the fact that she's trying to flee the jail tapes that's where she says i'm going to either commit suicide or flee, that's consciousness of guilt. All that stuff comes back to hurt them. And I'd love to ask Tim, because this is something that as a prosecutor, I just, our, we we listen to jail calls all the time. And on the jail calls, I tell you, it's being recorded. It's like a prosecutor's best friend. I still don't get why these defendants continue <laughs> to incriminate themselves on jail calls. You know, Tim, they, Tim why they do they do talk, it? Tim? Because they think they're talking in code. And sometimes I think they actually forget 
or they can't get visits and they're frustrated and they're trying to tell their baby mama, the girlfriend, their mom that they're innocent, they didn't do it. And then they'll say, well, they don't have the gun. So-and-so put the gun somewhere. And you're like, why? And I call prosecutors all the time. I'm like, can I come see you? And she goes, no, I'm listening to jail calls all afternoon. Um, it's, it, it, it's really bad for defendants. These are horrible. She, if she had any chance at all, this is going to kick her over. Uh, the flight risk, the planning, the suicide, and, and not even doing it. She admitted why she was doing it on phone calls to her co-conspirator. It was her way to say goodbye to her doting son. Right? And this is why you go piece by piece, right? You would not have had this incriminating evidence if you did not prosecute Charlie and convict Charlie. Now let's see what happens next with Harvey. And maybe Charlie will end up incriminating, give, give incriminating evidence against Wendy. There's no chance, I think, that Donna gives up her, excuse me, it gives up Wendy. You never know. Maybe Donna gives up her husband. It's one thing, the love between a mother and daughter. Mother and husband, maybe. <laughs> Charlie, though, I think could still give up Wendy, but not his mom. Listen, my, my parents were madly in love, married over 63 years. Pol polar opposites, by the way. But I was wondering today, was Harvey like, wow, I got out of this scot-free and did he head over to the local bar after he got off the plane and he's celebrating? Who knows? Harvey is very mysterious. We have no idea what's going on. Dave Ehrenberg, last night we had on Tommy Scoville, who was is a very interesting guy, professional skier. He was a public speaker. He got injured. He went down a terrible path of drug addiction, ended up behind bars. Um, and he has amazing insight into what Donna's first night in jail must have been like the reason i'm coming to you has nothing to do with that but you run the state attorney's office in palm beach county take us inside the leon county state attorney's office what was going on the last week since charlie's conviction obviously they were monitoring um donna in some capacity they thought she might go and they caught her as a matter of fact it was the same fbi agent pat sanford who testified. So what was going on inside the office with Jack Campbell and Georgia Kaplan? Give us a little inside peek. Well, remember last time I was on with you, Joel, I was asked either from you or by one of your viewers, if Donna could just flee, what's going to stop her? And I said, no, they've got eyes on her. Their plan was clearly to go piece by piece and then to go after Donna next. And, you know, Georgia sort of tipped her hand when she said, stay tuned. You don't say stay tuned if you're going to end the case right then and there. But the reason why there was still some uncertainty is that if Charlie was acquitted, that case would be over. That, that's it. Mm -hmm. That'd be the end of the line. Now, if he was um, like Katie, Katie and had a hung jury, I think the indictment of Donna would have been delayed. So once they got Charlie, it was just a matter of time till they got Donna. And and really, it was going to be up to Georgia, Georgia Kappelman. Because although Jack Campbell is a decision maker, as state attorney, you rely on the prosecutors who have the case. And this is Georgia's case. She knows more about this case than anyone else in that office. So she would go to Jack Campbell and say, OK, we have enough. Let's go and get Donna. Then you have to wait till there's a grand jury. Because this is a first degree murder case, it's a capital case, you have to indict someone through a grand jury. It's Florida law. Now, some people may say, well, how'd they arrest her? Uh, on the way to Dubai and Vietnam if the, the grand jury hadn't met. Well, what happened is, in this case, they got word that she was about to flee. She was going to the airport. So police have the ability to make an arrest based on probable cause, a probable cause arrest, which they did. But you have to indict her within with the grand jury within 21 days. So mm -hmm. they did the arrest here because she was about to flee. And now they're going to have to go to a grand jury within 21 days, which they were going to do anyway. So that's what was happening. Someone if, you look at the, if you look at the, the order signed by the judge, he signed the warrant at 545 on month yesterday, and she was arrested at 8 o'clock in Miami. Hmm. By the way, Ryan Fitzpatrick has just joined us. Ryan, you hearing us okay? Yes, sir, I am. Thanks for having me, guys. We're, we're going to come to you in, in just a couple of minutes. Ryan is uh, Charlie Adelson's ex-best friend. He testified in his most recent trial, and Ryan has perspective that I don't think anyone else has about the Adelsons. We're going to get to him in a moment. But back to Terry Austin, a host of uh, Law and Crime Network. 
So let's get into the meat and potatoes. So what we found out in this PCA, this probable cause affidavit, is that after Charlie's conviction, and this is what Dave was asking Tim about in a kind of befuddled way, as would I, not understanding why they would talk so openly on uh, jail calls, but they basically, Donna opened up to uh, Charlie um, and told him on these jailhouse calls that she was contemplating fleeing the country or perhaps even taking her own life, committing suicide, literally one week to the day that he was convicted, that her son was convicted. Terry, this is, number one, sad and depressing because she's talking about possibly killing herself. And number two, incredibly damning, isn't it, from a legal perspective? Oh, absolutely. It is consciousness of guilt. There's no question about it. And I covered that trial against Charlie. Actually, Long Crime covered all the trials. The two McManawa trials, the Garcia Rivera was the one who flipped, but we covered each and one of those trials. And clearly, I think Georgia Kaplan and David, I said this before you got on, I thought her strategy was amazing going after these individuals one at a time. But throughout the trial against Charlie Adelson, she was mentioning Donna. She obviously called Wendy as a witness and Wendy testified, but she didn't really go after Wendy. And as I mentioned, Wendy has this use immunity. It's not, you know, full immunity. It's not transactional immunity, but, you know, her words can't be used against her. But it was clear to me during Charlie Adelson's trial that she was going to go after Donna. It was very clear from the emails that she was reading that Donna wrote. And I think it really did affect Donna. And, you know, when you make a call to your son and he is a doting child, I think that's exactly right. He is the one who did her bidding. And when you get on a conversation and your son is in jail for the rest of his natural life, probably we'll see what happens with the sentencing in December. But, you know, she's desperate here. She's feeling at her lowest point. And I think she forgot that these calls are being recorded and she's telling him how she really feels. She feels as though she could commit suicide or she wants to get out of the country and that will be used against her. No question about it. And I think there's tons of evidence against her. And I think Georgia Kaplan is, is an amazing prosecutor. And I think she did an excellent job throughout the trial and throughout all of these trials. And I think David's absolutely right. She knows what she's doing. She knows more about this case than anybody else. And I think, frankly, she's going to get that indictment. I think they'll ultimately get, you know, a conviction that she doesn't get a plea, frankly. And Georgia is tough as they come. And a lot of people gave her heat for the uh, cross exam of Charlie Adelson. But obviously in the end, she knew what she was doing and maybe it was a game of 4D chess. Jeremy Mutz, this is an actual quote from the probable cause affidavit. Jail calls from after Charlie Adelson's guilty verdict include multiple calls in which Donna Sue Adelson is telling Charles Adelson that she is getting things in order, creating trusts, and making sure her grandchildren are taken care of. Donna discusses plans for a suicide, but also discusses plans to flee to a non-extradition country Donna Sue Adelson has considerable financial resources to do this. Uh, the only confusing part of this, Jeremy, and obviously they're in distress. Why suicide on the one hand and then Vietnam on the other? You know, they're conniving. There's no doubt about it. Was there something larger at play here? How do you read this? Probably just the emotions of the person. I mean, she's getting her plan together to flee. I mean, she knows what's up. She knows what's coming. She's going to run. But you know, this is a, this is taking an emotional toll. And, and I think most people, this would be highly stressful and emotional. They may say things like that. Well, you know, I, I'm just going to end it all. You know, I don't I don't know that she was really serious about that um, above fleeing. I think that was the number one. And I think that's why, you know, we put the wheels in motion for the state to stay on top of this and not let her get on that plane um, to say that on the jail calls like like we've been saying, you know, some people just they don't think they're going to get caught. They, they don't think it's going to happen to me. You know, that warning is on the jail calls right there by the phone. But it's like a lot of things. I, I don't think it's going to happen to me. So I'm going to talk. I'm making these plans and 
it sure will be a, a big piece of the evidence at trial because if the jury hears that, um, it's hard to defend that. There's there's no mistaking that. There's no extortion uh, defense to, to say, you know, I'm running away from the extortioners this time around. That's not going to work. Ryan, I promise I'm I'm promise I'm coming to you, Dave. I'm coming to you though right now. Just some more inside baseball. You're the Florida State Attorney out of Palm Beach County. Let's say you have Jack Campbell's job, and you know this high-profile guy was just uh, taken into custody, facing a life sentence. Are you listening to every single call the minute he makes a call? How, how's that work? Uh, as Tim mentioned, that sometimes he has trouble meeting with prosecutors because. They spend all day listening to jail calls. My <laughs> assistant state attorneys spend hours listening to jail calls. It is incredibly <laughs> fruitful uh, when you listen to these things because, uh, yeah, Jeremy, as you said, you, you don't think you're going to get caught. Donna thought she knew everything, but her whole world is cracking down because she realized that she didn't know what she thought she knew. It's like she she's not smarter than everyone else, and she's not above the law. And when she came to that realization, it's got to be hard on her. And she let this all out. Meanwhile, there's a sign right there in front of her saying your calls are being recorded, but she ignores it and it's going to be used against her. Think about how powerful the Dolce Vita call was against Charlie, where he said, hey, if they had anything on me, I'd be on the next flight out here. You didn't have any muffled sounds around. This is Donna saying this at the worst possible time in a very clear voice. So they got her. Now the question is, who else are they going to get next? So I'm already like locked, checking the box here that they've got Donna in this case. Since Dave just mentioned it, let's take a listen to this. This is the Dolce Vita tapes, the now infamous Dolce Vita tapes. Charlie talking about racing to the airport. Quick listen. We looped that twice. If they had any evidence, we've already gone. We would have already gone to the airport. That's exactly the advice Donna took. Ryan, I'm coming to you in just one second, but there's a question for Tim here. Uh, Tim, how does immunity work for Wendy as she lied on the stand through three trials? Uh, you broke the news today about this Castigar precedent, which we'll get into in a little while. But sticking to this, um, is she up the creek without a paddle if she did, in fact, perjure herself? Well, she has derivative use immunity. Um, she does not have immunity from perjury. Uh, perj if she perjured herself, they can use those statements against her. You don't really see perjury convictions. But in her case, I think they might do it. Because if they don't have enough to charge her with the most serious offenses, if they can get it with perjury, then a judge sitting on the case will know the overall background. And I think they could probably get her a max give her a maximum sentence make her a convicted felon. They would only do that if they couldn't um, have enough evidence to prosecute her. But yeah, if she lies, she's not protected, but she still has immunity for what she says against her, except for perjury. Uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick, I enjoyed watching you up there on the, uh, on the witness stand during this trial. You seem to give zero, you know what, it rhymes with ducks. I won't say the word because I'll get demonetized. Um, <laughs> Truly one of those guys. Some people said to me, hey, why are you bring this guy on? Because he said the miserable and it rhymes with few. But uh, I will cut you some slack on that. Something that I, you know, probably many of us say, uh, unfortunately, about other people. But I know you were good friends with uh, Charlie at one point. Number one, what was it like to testify in such a high profile case? Uh, yeah, it's not something that I do uh, for a living or I do on a daily basis. I'll tell you that. But um Hey, I didn't have a choice. Uh, when the government comes knocking, uh, you show up. And uh, there's a lot of people that give me a lot of grief and say, hey, I can't believe you're going to testify against your best friend. Well, I'd rather do that than spend, you know, the the time of the trial in contempt, which I mean, Wendy needs me to explain that to her. They'll put you in jail. Um, but I, it just with this family, the whole process, like, I mean, you guys really don't think you're getting recorded on a jailhouse phone call? And then I asked you guys, the professional panel, you know, is her talk of doing uh, committing suicide? Is that for her to just placate or play like a victim? Is that something that she does? I mean, do you really think once she got away with it or whatever, she was really going to do that? I, I just think this story gets crazier and crazier every day. And I, I'm just glad to see that the, the train cars that 
Georgia was describing to us in the trial, it's now a train wreck and these <laughs> people are going to do time for what they've done. So, And, and I want to get some work, you know, color from you about the Adelson family, some interactions that you've had, but Terry, uh, Ryan brings up a good point. We raised it earlier about this threat to commit suicide. How do you read into that? Do you see that as something maybe um, that's more of a ploy on, on the part of the Adelsons or an actual threat to take her own life? Well, if it is an actual threat to take her own life, you know, I'm hoping that she's not going to do that and she's getting the help that she needs. If it is a ploy, I think it is as low as you can possibly get. You know, we have to ask, does she recognize the fact that this is being recorded? If we answer that question, yes, and it is a ploy, then, you know, she is trying to play the victim. Maybe she is trying to say, like her son, she was the victim of this whole, you know, trying to get her to pay money. And, and you know, she's being influenced here by these criminals who are, you know, holding this over their head. And, you know, that is as about as low as you can get. Now, we do know that she wrote all these emails. I referred to them before. She's, she's a bright woman. She's a mastermind here. So if you think that she knows she's being recorded and she's saying this suicide as, you know, a way to get some sympathy, it does go against, though, that she says she's going to flee the country. I mean, you can't say those two things. So... I think she, if I had to make a decision right now, based on what I've heard, I would say she's just distraught and saying anything that comes to her mind. I'm on with my son. I'm really distraught. Oh my God, I, I can't take this. You're in jail. Everything's coming down around me. I'm, I'm going to commit suicide or get out of here. I mean, I, I think that's what it it literally was. I'm, I'm not sure she was in an emotional state at that point to actually continue conniving behind the scenes. Although we know she has that ability. Jeremy Mutz from Johnny Supertramp perjury, then go after uh, the law license of Wendy Adelson um, at the very least. Is that something that's going to happen at the very least? Are they going to take her career from her at this point? You know, perjury is so seldom prosecuted. that There've been times where, you know, I've been in family law cases or I've been in other cases where I thought, you know, I write something up for the state attorney's office in a, in a locality. They they just there's a very big reluctance to, to touch that. And probably for some good reason, because there's a lot of nuance in these things. And I don't know that juries would really find a lot of appeal in most of these uh, perjury allegations. This one here might be a little different because of the, you know, the context of it. I just don't think it's very likely I think the biggest thing that's going to drive the decision with Wendy is the fact that to be an accessory to a murder, you look at things like the text message she sent to Dan to find out his schedule. Well, if I'm defending her, that's automatic reasonable doubt built in that because she's got two kids with him. Of course, she's going to be in communication about where he's going to be that, that week in July. So I just don't think there's enough there for, to be a principal to murder. There's, there's no act in furtherance. There's a lot of text messages. There's a lot of uh, things that don't put her in a good light. You know, I think personally she, she knew about it. She was involved in it, but you know, can you convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt of that? I, I just don't see it with her. And Kim Jansen, I know you feel the same way. Uh, there's a question here. You think Donna is going to turn on Wendy. That's one Don on Wendy. Here's the second that Jeremy was just talking about. Can't they charge Wendy as an accessory to murder? Tim Jansen, why can't they, uh, according to Jeremy Mutz? If they could have charged her, they would have charged her. <laughs> There's no reason why they wouldn't. Georgia would love to charge Wendy with murder, conspiracy, and solicitation. They got that little thing, though. It's called evidence. <laughs> and that little evidence is something they need to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And... Georgia, it, it, she's doing her job. She's methodically going down the line, and we'll see where she goes. But I, I just don't think she has it. I agree with Jeremy. I, no one likes Wendy. Everybody thinks she might have been involved. But we don't have a real overt act that assisted the conspiracy. Driving by the scene afterwards, I don't think that's enough to be a, an overt act. The crime had already been occurred. What did she do? Did she try to cover it up? 
you can get her for perjury or lying to the police in her interview, but that's not enough to get her as a principal. And then you got the whole immunity thing, the Castigar issues with that. Um, I just don't think they have enough for her. Um, and if Georgia has more, as Dave knows, she may have more than what we know, right? But then ask yourself, why hasn't she been charged? Well, Can you explain that a little bit more, Tim, for us people, little brains, the Castigar issue? I know that you've been very consistent in all your opinions, but I think a lot of people would like to have that explained a little bit more. Yeah, and by the way, people, uh, real quick, people don't know this, but Ryan, your father's a criminal defense attorney and looks a little like Tim Jansen, you said, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, he reminds me of Tim. Uh, he's passed away since, but he was a civil litigator down in Arcadia, Florida for 35 plus years. Um, and I spent time in a trial firm in Clearwater for many years before um, moving on to what I'm doing now. But you know, it's just hearing these questions, and I know people, because I, I watch you know, the show so much. And Tim has been so consistent in his opinion, which I respect as well. He speaks the facts. It's not based upon emotion, but I really, the casting are something I'm not familiar with, and I know a lot of people aren't. And for her to be contacting a, a attorney that specializes this in Atlanta, as you referred to earlier today, Tim, um, what, how does that play into her advantage? And as far as the perjury as uh, Jeremy was saying, I've heard many times how hard that is to prove anyway. So that shouldn't even be really on the table to discuss. But the Castigar is very interesting to me. So Castigar is a, a United States Supreme Court case, all right? And it, you deal with it more in federal court than you do in state cases. Because states don't usually have this issue with giving derivative use immunity to witnesses that are possibly targets of the investigation. So what they can't do, they can't use anything she said on the stand at any time they compelled her, right? And the reason why this rule is because you are being forced to speak. So you should never be penalized when you're forced to speak, but it's got derivative use, means they can't follow leads from what she says. They have to get independent evidence from what she says. And it's a hurdle that the state will have to prove to a judge and the defense is preparing for Castigar issues, which makes it cumbersome at least a little cumbersome for them to get above those hurdles. It's not impossible, but when you have lack of evidence and the Castigar issues, that makes it doubly problematic. And that's probably the reason why they did not give use immunity or subpoenas to Donna and Harvey, because they knew they were going to charge Donna. They didn't want to have that issue. All right. Thank you. Shout out to our friend. Hey, did I say that right, Dave? <laughs> yeah, we don't use that. In fact, Joel was upset with me while I wasn't as familiar with Castigar. Um, <laughs> and it's because we don't use that in the state system, really. As, as uh, Tim said, that's a federal thing generally. But I, if I could add, Joel, I agree with the panel, Tim and Jeremy, Terry. I think that if they had enough evidence on Wendy, they would have charged her already. I don't think they're going to charge her with perjury at this point. Maybe they reassess and they could. And perhaps... One thing I'd love to ask this group is which one of her statements is the most obvious, do you think, for a perjury count? And then just if I can add this one thing. Uh, so one thing I want to uh, stress is that although Tim is correct, they don't have enough evidence against Wendy yet, you don't need to show that Wendy committed an overt act as long as you could show that she agreed to be part of the conspiracy, right? right. Then it's any one member of the conspiracy commits the overt act and they all go down. Can you have, do you have enough evidence to show that Wendy agreed to the conspiracy, perhaps the text message where she said, oh, brother, you know, Charlie, you're so sweet what you're doing for me, something like that. But it is a tougher haul than going after Donna. Right. Terry, I'm curious to get your take on that, Terry. And there's, you know, obviously there's some cases to be made. One of them is that she seemingly tried to frame her new boyfriend, Jeffrey Lacoste, a guy that looked a lot like, her ex-husband <laughs> and that just happened to leave town when she wasn't expecting it. Your response to Dave's comment there. You know, it's interesting because I don't think they could get Wendy for perjury either. So I agree with that. I think it's hard to prove that. And the reward, it's not worth, you know, it's not the bang for the buck that you really want. I think, you know, she couched all her answers in the case with, I don't recall her. That's not my recollection or to something to that effect. So I don't think there's anything hard and fast that they could really get her on and it's it's not worth it. You know, as for, you know, getting her based on what she said and, and 
making sure that those Castigar issues are addressed, I don't think it's worth going after her for that either because she does have that use immunity and they can't use her words against her. I mean, obviously if they have some independent evidence, a witness saw her with the gun in her hand or something to that effect, they can go after her, but that's not the case. They don't have anything like that. They have very little evidence against her. So I definitely don't think they want to take Wendy on at this point. And I do think that they pursued these defendants in the order that they did for very good reason. And, you know, so I, I agree with the panel that, that Wendy is probably safe for now. And did you have another question in there, Joel, about I think, Wendy? I, I think we're going to cir we'll circle back with another one. Before I get in trouble from the COE who runs the show behind the scenes, shout out to her, shout out to Space Coast who handles all the tech stuff, and Steve Cohen, otherwise known as Meve Moen, who gets guys like Dave Ehrenberg and Terry and Jeremy and Ryan and Tim Jansen on the show. He is uh, the brains behind the operation. Uh, Black Widower, she donated five membership. Thank you to the mods as well. That goes without saying, COE. She's always on my case, uh, but that goes without saying. Black Widower comes to us from the Republic of Ireland. If you're new to STS, our community spans the globe. Uh, the COE will yell at me if I do not say, please support us on Patreon or get a YouTube membership. If times are tough, um, even if times aren't tough and you're in the car, please listen to us on audio and give us five stars. It helps us so much with building this podcast. And uh, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, I joke, I don't want another Adelson arrested, not tonight, because I don't think I can handle it physically. But um, I guess the odds, the, the odds are... <laughs> yeah, look at Tim Jansen. He's on the phone getting the information. Um, <laughs> Jeremy, this that's what happened last night. Jeremy, there's um, there is a couple questions here. I'm going to let you take them. One is, why have a perjury law and swear witnesses in, followed by Teresa, who comes okay. to us from Scotland, I believe. Why is the threat of going to jail if one commits perjury there if it's never, ever used? Why is that, Jeremy? Well, I think it's still a deterrent, but like a lot of laws, the people that are going to be deterred uh, by that aren't going to perjure themselves anyway. But, you know, it's still there for the most extreme circumstances. It's not to say it's never done. Um, it certainly is. It is certainly is prosecuted. But, uh, you know, it, we don't I don't think we want to have a lot of people prosecuted left and right for perjury because some of these things really is a nuance. The thing that they lied about, is it material to the case? For instance, with Wendy going to the scene, there's a little bit of a gray area there. What exactly she said about where she pulled up, what she saw, was that material to the case? You know, and so there's there's just some real problems there. Um, but it's still it's still a deterrent. If I walk into the courtroom and I've had to testify in cases before, you know, I've had to, you know, be sworn in. And it's certainly something I'm thinking about how serious that is to my license and so forth. Um, I think it's like a lot of laws. There, there are a lot of laws you could look at and say, well, why is that on the books if we if we seldom use it? But it's still there, I think, for the most extreme circumstances and to set a tone in the courtroom that that this is serious, that, uh, you know, the same reason we do still swear an oath or, or people affirm. It's just to try to set that tone that it's different in the courtroom. You know, people's lives are at stake, their liberties are at stake and things like that. And I think it still still has that function. Hey, Joe, hey, 30 years, I've never seen a perjury conviction or prosecution in Leon County. Um, it's more custom, and it is to try to get people to tell the truth, hopefully. Uh, lawyers are the ones most subject to perjury because the, the judges can send them, refer them to the Florida bar if they feel they have committed perjury. <laughs> to the regular person on the street, domestic violence cases, you know, Jeremy, the victim comes in says, oh, I really didn't mean to say that. I was, I was just mad at him. And they're never going to convict a victim of perjury because then that will stop victims from coming forward. And that's a whole different issue. But the perjury is never prosecuted. And as a prosecutor, you know, you, you don't want to get in the habit of prosecuting domestic violence victims. So that's the, you know, you, you don't, you're frustrated with people lying and wasting all this time. But here's somebody who's been abused, been through trauma, you don't want to re-traumatize them to to prove a point, and, and so it, it's difficult. The 
being a prosecutor is probably one of the toughest jobs there is for that type of case, domestic violence. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if I was, I don't know if I was lucky or didn't know any better, but I did a lot of domestic violence uh, prosecutions and, you know, you know, I'm glad I did. I don't know that I'd want to do it again. And you heard Tim Jansen saying 30 years, never a perjury conviction. Uh, this comment just making me laugh a little bit. Well, I can't see her doing a crab walk escape. That is, of course, a reference to Danilo Calvacante, who escaped from prison. If there's someone in STS Nation who wants to send me a Photoshop picture of Donna crab walking out of uh, the Miami-Dade County Jail, feel free. I'll accept that. Tim, go ahead. Let me give you an example. I had a client who was being accosted by her neighbors, and they chart, they alleged that she did all this stuff that was improper. Well, she didn't live in Tallahassee. She lived in Palm Beach or Jupiter. So she gets a call from the police saying your neighbor just said you pointed a gun at her and uh, assaulted her. And they were knocking at her door. She goes, what are you talking about? She goes, yeah, like 30 minutes ago. She goes, I'm here in West. I'm here in Jupiter. And we had a, a camera in her garage showing she was in Jupiter. And this lady made a claim, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon. And this police would not prosecute for filing a false, false police report. Would not with all that evidence. That's not because of uh, the prosecution team in Palm Beach County. I can just tell you that. <laughs> no, no, no. But yeah, I'm just saying it was so blatant and obvious. They had her in a different place and they still didn't want to pursue it. Tim Jansen, be careful with the towns you mentioned, Jupiter and Palm Beach County. Jack Campbell here. Um, this is for you, Dave Arenberg, and Dave's going to have to run uh, at the top of the hour. But Jack Campbell a quote from him about nabbing Donna Adelson. That's what forced our hand to some of our law enforcement partners about the complexities of trying to bring someone back from either Dubai or Vietnam. And that might be a very complicated and lengthy process. So that's why we had to make a decision quickly. Uh, what more do we need to know about that comment? Again, Dave, I'm just fascinated about what, what really goes on uh, behind closed doors. I mean, were there moments where Jack Campbell is calling Georgia into his office and, and saying, hey, we're getting intel that it looks like they're about to take off and we've got to do something uh, again? I mean, how did all of that sort of play out from yeah. moment to moment? Yeah, it's actually the reverse. So it's Georgia who would go to Jack Campbell's office and, hey, our uh, law enforcement partners have said that uh, they've got eyes on her and she's getting to the airport. She's leaving the country. And then Jack has to make a decision. Hey, what are we going to do? Because the grand jury hasn't met yet. There's been no indictment. So they said, let's go pick her up. Pick her up because we can't afford to have her leave. Now, again, this is another difference between the state and the feds. The feds have a lot more power to extradite someone, even if you have a country like Vietnam, which has no extradition agreement. We state officials, we got to go to connections we have with the feds. And then hopefully someone will take our call and then you can work with the international authorities, it is much more complicated than if we are assistant U.S. attorneys. They can extradite people more easily than we can. So the last thing that Jack Campbell wanted was for Donna to get on that plane, leave the country, and then have to deal with an extradition mess and have to deal with the State Department and our federal partners. So that's why he's like, take her down now. Mm. Yeah. Dave Arenberg, you're a gentleman and scholar. You know I want you to stay for another hour, but I know you're going to have to run at some point. Um, love having you here. It, thank you guys. This has been a great panel and, uh, it's good to be on with you. Fitz magic. I've been wanting to say that since, uh, I saw you test. I'm sure you get that all the time. <laughs> it's magic. So I'm not Dave? six, four. And I didn't go to Harvard. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hey Dave, you better, better read up about Castigar tonight. I'm going to be on court TV with you. By the way, there's never better guests on any panel except tonight. You got me, Aaron Berg and Tim Jansen. If you thought I was the black sheep before, wait till tonight. Well, you know, Joel, I love being on Court TV with you, but I go on with Terry on Law and Crime, and we love it there, too. Um, and one last thing on Castigar, I, you know, look, I know about use immunity and derivative use immunity. <laughs> it's just the names of these federal cases that don't really come down to Florida. Okay, so give me a pass on that one. It's with a, it's with a, it's with a K, David. I'll see you on Court TV. <laughs> we'll talk about it. Thank you. Um, look at this. This is why I love SCS Nation. Okay, I'm on it, Joel. We're going to get a Photoshop picture of Donna Adelson crab walking a la Danilo Cavalcante. That's why you got to follow me on Twitter at Podcast STS, at Podcast STS on Twitter for Showtimes. And then on Instagram, it is at Surviving the Survivor. That's where I'll put up the shot 
of uh, Donna Adelson crab walking up the Miami-Dade County uh, jail. And let me tell you something. That is not a pretty place in any way, shape, or form. Um, Terry, let's watch. This is the first appearance today by Donna Adelson. It feels like it was six months ago. It happened this morning. This is in Miami-Dade County. Uh, let's watch together. Let me get rid of this comment from I Am Not T-Pain. And then walk us through what we're watching. And you'll notice Donna is in what they call a turtle suit. That is for her own protection. So she cannot kill herself uh, while behind bars. And she does not say a word. And her attorney seems to not really fully understand extradition in the state of Florida. Here we go. Let's take a listen. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. And I apologize. It is an in-state warrant. I did write out of state. <laughs> We have a busy calendar today, so you do. Good morning, ma'am. Ma'am, you were arrested on a warrant from Leon County, Florida. The charges are public order crimes. It says attempted solicitation conspiracy to commit a capital felony, homicide, willful, it says homicide, but maybe attempted homicide, I'm sorry. Attempted solicitation or conspiracy to commit homicide. It looks like two counts of that. So your attorney is here. Uh, Ms. Del Caso, anything you wanna say? Good morning, Your Honor. Marisol Descalzo on behalf of Donna Adelson. Uh, we are going to waive extradition to uh, Leon County. It's, a, it's an in-state warrant, which means, so basically you have a warrant from Leon County. It sounds like really serious charges. They have up to 15 days to come and pick you up. The reset date here is uh, November 29th to make sure you get picked up. So Ms. Del Caso, what you can do is reach out to Leon County, the prosecutor's office there and see if they'll agree to a bond. If they do agree to a bond, you're welcome to contact Ms. F. She can send you a sample order we use. And with that order, um, we can sign- Because I think it's unlikely there's gonna be an agreement on this case. A solicitation case, anyway. Okay, so you wanna hear something funny though? She looks like a lady that was on my airplane yesterday. Mm -hmm. Did you come in from Paris? I did not. <laughs> I wish. She looks like a lady who's on the airplane with me, for real. Yeah. And I'm sorry you're going through all this. They have 15 days to pick you up. The reset, reset date's November 29th, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. Good luck to you. That's it for that. Okay. She says, good luck to you. And uh, Donna rolls her eyes at the judge. A lot of people took notice of that. Maybe we'll go back and watch that in a little bit. But Terry Austin, just kind of walk us through what just transpired at this, what they call a first appearance in the Miami-Dade County Courthouse. Well, it was a procedural appearance there. And the parties are just noting for the record who's representing whom. And obviously, Donna's attorney is representing her and the judge very quickly, Judge Glazer, very quickly said, no, nah, no, extradition doesn't count here. We're in the same state. You're going to have to try to figure out bond. Um, and there is going to be no bond. Uh, clearly, it sounds as though she's going to remain behind bars. They'll have another hearing on the date that they just mentioned. And, um, you know, she was in a turtle suit, as you said. And partially probably because they heard those recordings about her saying she might commit suicide or mm -hmm. she's going to try to flee, which obviously she did. So I think that it was uh, expected. I think it was routine. And I think that this is what we can see going forward in terms of, you know, what she's going to be getting. I don't think she's going to have any sort of um, extra treatment because she is who she is. And in fact, she looked very demure. She looked very frail. And I don't think she's going to hold up that well while she is behind bars. And I think they are going to get an indictment in the timely fashion. And I think she will remain behind bars until her trial is finished, whether she is convicted or whether she's acquitted 
or whether there's a mistrial. I think she's going to be behind bars until this is all concluded. There's a good chance she will never see the light of day again. I was talking to a former inmate last night who was on the show, Tommy Scoville. Shout out to Lifeboat on YouTube. There was a moment yesterday where she took one step as a free woman and the next step she was in custody and she might never, ever be out of custody for the rest of her life. If it goes anything uh, the way it did for Charlie Adelson, McSpunky, big friend of the show, Donna in her turtle suit is the newest Ninja Turtle, Pupatello, my son's obsessed with Ninja Turtles. I didn't grow up with Ninja Turtles. I'm too old for that. You know what? And uh, my kid's obsessed. So I pretend to know him all and he comes at me with a sword and flips all over me and I got to sit there and pretend I know who he's talking about, but that's besides the point. Um, Jeremy Mutz. And then I'm coming back. I want to hear about Ryan Fitzpatrick's steamy relationship with Charlie Adelson in just a moment. We're going to get to that in a second, but uh, with Donna mentioning moving money, Jeremy Mutz to trust, is there any way to prevent that? Assuming she's hiding money like Murdoch did. I can't imagine the Mark Hellboys wanting Adelson blood money, to be honest. But in terms of moving money around, is there something that the state can do right now, freezing assets or something along those lines? It might be something that the FBI would be involved in. Um, I'm not sure about that. I think there's some things that certainly could be done there. You know, I've had guardianship cases where, you know, guardian is appointed. Accounts are frozen, things like that. It's a possibility. Um, you know, look at how far she's fallen, though, you know, from the icon apartments down to wearing the turtle suit. And it's probably worse than that because I've had a client on charge with first degree murder. And uh, in his cell, he was in this kind of firm blanket that he could barely wrap around himself, almost like cardboard, to prevent him from the possibility of of uh, suicide. So I'd visit him. He'd be, he'd be naked other than that, that thing around him. So it's not a pleasant life, but uh, yeah, there could be some things the state tries to do about the assets and uh, you know, it's rare and unusual, but this case just takes more and more unusual paths. Really. The state has no basis to freeze any of her assets. This is not a fraud case. It's not a federal case. Um, it's, it's a violent crime. Um, I don't see a requirement by a Nebbia hearing for bond. Um, none of that. Um, I don't see if they have any ability to freeze assets. They had a business. Um, I don't know of IRS doing any investigations against them. I don't think there's a basis to touch any of their accounts. They're just moving their money into trust accounts for uh, if they die and pass it on to their kids without paying taxes. Nothing illegal about that. You know what? We, can I chime in real quick? Yes, you sure can, well, Ryan. What was interesting to me, uh, because I've been around them for so long, is when they started disclosing all of the financials that they did. And it was up there on the board and it was in color. We had graphs and charts. I mean, let's be honest. They knew they did it. They know what they've done. They know what they're going through. They know the turmoil. I witnessed it. So if you've got eight and a half million in the bank with you and your mom, you and your dad, you know, probably 64 properties paid off with no mortgage. You're collecting rent on a lot of cash. Why wait now? Why why wait till Charlie's already convicted? Why when Charlie was in Vietnam or when Charlie was in Croatia, one of the number one places on earth to hide from the FBI or the federal government? I mean, is it that the narcissism or the, the arrogance that we really think we're going to get away with this? We've gotten away with everything. We've got money. And they, I mean... I think, except for, and I hate to use the word excitement, that we've seen the arrest that we've been calling for for so many years, but I don't think there was any more people in in this in this state that were shocked more than the Adelsons getting arrested. I mean, it blows my mind. They have, they have enough money to live anywhere on earth, and, and that's what I would like to know as well. When she was arrested or apprehended, and, and Harvey was with her, right? I mean... Did they have a sack full of diamonds? I mean, because it's hard to travel with eight million cash. So what? What? I mean, had they transferred money? I mean, you don't just say, "Hey, I'm going to Vietnam broke." I mean, does she have big old piles of cash with her, diamonds or jewelry? I mean, it's well, interesting. Terry, yeah, we know Terry. We know that Charlie had visited these countries. Maybe he set up some sort of egg net. Uh, what is it? Nest egg. Nest egg. Yes. I told you I was tired. Uh, Terry. Um. 
but to I mean, Ryan makes a great point. Yeah. They could have f- fled a long time ago. They didn't. Do you think that it was just that the reality hadn't quite set in? They obviously waited too long now. But to Ryan's point, what do you think was going on here? It sounds to me as if they waited too long. They really hadn't thought about how are we going to deal with our finances and. Frankly, a lot of people do that. I mean, brilliant people, lawyers, doctors, Indian chiefs, they don't set up the trusts and the wills and the estate the way that they should until it dawns on them, oh, I'm going traveling to another country or I might be in jail for the rest of my life. Let me make sure I put our affairs in order. And I think when she was saying that to Charlie, it was saying to him, look, I don't know what's going to happen I'm depressed. I could commit suicide here. I could flee the country. But the bottom line is, look, I'm putting our affairs in order. I'm setting up these trusts. And I, I do agree. I don't think that there is a valid claim to freeze the assets, although I'm sure that's what the government would like to do, but they don't have any claim. It's not as though these people have been charged with conspiracy, murder, solicitation. It's not as though they defrauded the government and they have these victims that need this money. And so let's just freeze those assets. So I definitely think that she's just trying to get her affairs in order. They hadn't done it before. And Ryan, I can't explain why she hadn't done it before, but it seems to me that the realization has finally hit that it's now or never. Uh, Tim Jansen, this question is for you. Then I'm going to dig in for a minute with Ryan Fitzpatrick on the Adelsons. KCL from Salt Lake City, friend of the show. Uh, So Donna, will she be back in Tallahassee sooner rather than later? You heard the judge in Miami say 15 days. Um, When should we expect her to be on that bus to Leon County, Tim? Well, I talked to Monica, whose husband works at the sheriff's office, who used to run the jail. (laughs) And she said they'll have a two car transport. One will be a a deputy car and the other will be a plain clothes car. Uh, She'll probably be here for Thanksgiving. Um, So we can all have a Thanksgiving knowing Donna is in custody. Um, I'm guessing what happened, they were setting up irrevocable trusts that the money could, if they get charged and they get convicted, they can't sue them. The money will not be touchable by a lawsuit and will go to the grandkids. That's what I'm assuming they were doing. She was sending messages to him. We're getting our stuff in order. I want to say goodbye to you. This is what we're going to do. Not sure what we're going to do, but this is our plans. Here's the comment. Sally Williams, I want to hear uh, Ryan about the Adelsons. We're getting there right now. But uh, first, old lady Snoop, almost forgot to tell you, Joel, loved your giant cheeky smile this morning on True Crime Daily. I was a guest on True Crime Daily, the episode that dropped today. It's about the Adelsons, Caitlin Armstrong, and also the Visine Drops murder where that woman was convicted today. Um, Ryan, when did you first, before we get there, what was your reaction to Donna's arrest last night? Uh, I heard you quoted, I think you called her a yenta. That is a Yiddish word for uh, a woman that likes to talk a lot. Um, I got to tread lightly with comments. (laughs) (laughs) It's all right. You're safe here. Um, What was your reaction? Yeah, I what, what was your guys. reaction? What was your reaction? Uh, uh, you know, I, I can't ever, sh- I hate the fact that I show joy over this, but finally, you know, um, nine and a half years later, and like I said, no one could have been more shocked than Donna and Harvey. You know, they a one-way ticket too. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I got the text from Steve Cohen. I actually got a text from Judy. Um and I immediately turned on your show, and I watched you all night till you finished. So, and then I watched you today on my phone. I was working. I watched you at the dentist office. I need I more saw- Ryan Fitzpatrick. Make sure the dentist is watching also, please. But I need more <laughs> of you. Yeah. Well, I so- couldn't make any comments. I was I had a mouthful. But <laughs> so, so um, let me ask you: When did you first meet Charlie? Had you guys become friends? Well, you know, what was your take? I met Charlie through um, uh, mutual college friends. Um, Charlie was fun. You know, I think Tim ch- touched on it. I mean, he lived the life. He was a millionaire. He's a good looking guy. He had the grotto playboy style waterfall pool at the Ferrari. I mean, and he was funny. Um, you know, it, it really, once the rest started being, uh, started getting made, it become it became slowly unbearable uh, just to be around, and you start questioning. You're like, "Wow, I really 
caring about this. I mean, just being around the whole family, you know, you never, like I told Judy, it was never talked about. It was never discussed. I mean, you would almost thought that Dan uh, never existed, but I mean, we all know he did and he has a great legacy. He's left behind with two beautiful boys, but I mean, it got, it got weird. And especially when Katie got arrested, I told Judy, I said, I was there. I, I think the day that he got the news, I believe October of 2016, and you you could just tell. I mean, our buddies, you know, obviously I didn't have a crystal ball or magic eight ball or whatever to, you know, predict the future. But, I mean, there, there's certain behaviors that people, you know, put out there that you, you know why they're acting like this. And it was a long time coming. And we that's what I said. There were times when he went to the yacht uh, festival or whatever in Croatia. And it was like, why, why did you come back? you really think you're going to get away with this and it's not that i had hard evidence to make an opinion but it was just it, it, you know with the overwhelming amount of evidence that they had it was kept coming out slowly but surely and that's due to the methodical process of georgia kappelman and the state's attorney's office i mean just the patience of them to be able to one by one pick these people off and and they did it and i, I don't think there's any doubt in my mind or anyone, I don't want to speak for you, but on this panel's mind that it's going to go pretty much how we think it's going to go. I mean, there's not a lot. I mean, is the extortion plan going to come out or, I mean, it's, it's almost a Mickey Mouse defense and not in, you know, I do have respect for rash bomb. I mean, you can't turn chicken salad out of chicken. You know what, but you know, it's, he did the best he could with what he was given. So yeah, and yeah. Ryan, you've got a question here from Rula. She wants to know, Ryan, is Charlie as arrogant as he portrays to us, or is it just all a show? He's got this tough guy image. Uh, let me ask you, what do you think? How's he going to fare in state prison? Do you think when uh, guys come up and try to, you know, you know, mess with he's them? Gonna be, he's going to be giving away a lot of his lunches. I'll tell you that. Um, he better find someone that likes him because it's what I hear from the. You know, state max prism systems, it's not a place where you want to be. Um, so I, I, I think we've all seen enough prison movies to know how that's going to play out for them. So. You look like you could handle your own in, in a bar fight. I don't know about a prison fight, but can Charlie, you think Charlie can uh, stand up to that? Um, we were, we, we've had former inmates on. They say within the first four hours of being in state prison, someone's going to challenge him to a fight. Is Charlie <laughs> Adelson going to square up in that situation? And, I and fire know. back. I don't know. I I can't. I couldn't imagine him getting a fight. I mean, I guess he doesn't need his hands for surgery anymore. So we'll see. I mean, it's going to be rough. I mean, what is, gonna, I've heard stories about. What is it, Rayford or Rayford up there near Stark? Mm -hmm. That's just a gladiator academy. So I, I couldn't imagine a more horrible place to be on Earth, and I wouldn't want to be there. And why I don't break the law like that. So I mean. <laughs> Well, you know. um, Ryan, you better stay on the right side of the law. I'm going to keep an eye on you now. By the way, uh, Julia wants to know, are you going to be on Vinny tonight? Uh, we will be. Tim Jansen, myself, Dave Ehrenberg are going to be on with Vinny. I, I think he's back from vacation uh, tonight. Jeremy Munch, you've been to some of these state prisons in Florida. Uh, I'm, I know the name, but I'm not familiar with the one um, other than na by name that Ryan just mentioned. Tell us a little bit about it. Uh, you're an author. You're a writer. One of the things I had these former inmates talk about was the smell in there. Said it's sure. absolutely disgusting. Smells like feces. Smells like urine. You know, we just see it, but they're living and breathing this literally. What do you think life's going to be like in a state prison for Charlie Adelson? Well, the smell is big and, and not just those things, but the smell of the, the cleaners, the smell of food cooking is just constantly you're permeated with it. You know, it's not a it's not a nice place to be. the The food is not good. You know, you're you're not air conditioned and heated to the extent that you would like to be. You're with people that you know. Some people go to prison really bad, and some go there and learn how to be really bad. So he's in there with you know all of that mix of people. Um, will it be the hellscape that we we? sort of speculate about it could be but some people that i've i've talked to and i've both i've been on both sides i've put people in prison i've represented inmates in prison and i've represented state correctional officers and doctors that uh, are working in the prison so i've been on all sides of that 
a lot of people go there, they put their head down, they mind their own business and they make it through. And it is possible to do that, particularly if you're smart, you learn how to mind your own business, you keep your mouth shut. You know, you may still get in fights, but, you know, a lot of people make it through their time, you know, without a lot of discipline problems, without a lot of, you know, problems in the prison. So it's possible. And if they if they move him, if they do interstate compact and they trade him, you know, you talk about trading college uh, athletes or, or trading, trading professional athletes, they trade prisoners the same type of idea. If somebody in North Carolina is unsafe there, they may switch him with with Charlie and put him up there. So he disappears. He becomes, you know, he became he becomes John Smith and uh, he does OK. So it's certainly possible. Donna also, this is going to take a toll on her being in the jail. Um, but the the women's side of the Leon County Jail is, is not that bad. If she goes in and puts her head down and, you know, she'll have some of the younger ones look up to her. You know, she'll, she'll probably get along with them. Um, you know, it's oftentimes the younger ones, the younger ones that actually get into fights, you know, they're, they're probably not going to, you know, older ones not going to be in a fight so much. Uh, Adam Lamparello is an attorney. He says the conditions in prison are disgusting and inhumane. This country should be ashamed. There probably is a fairly large problem with that. This is another big issue, Tim Jansen. Uh, this grand jury, uh, there's talk about it convening on Wednesday, uh, possibly handing down an indictment. There's some reporting that there was already a quote unquote presentment already in the past tense to the state attorney's office. We don't really know. Tim, are we going to find out? Um, I don't know if they had already had a presentment. They wouldn't have had to do a probable cause arrest. They would have just unsealed the indictment that they had. So I don't know if that's true or not. Um, and it looked like they were doing a last minute they made this decision to get a judge and judge Everett signed it at like five forty-five yesterday. And I'm sure Pat Sanford was already down there. It looks like Jack Campbell was the person that signed for it and judge Everett signed it. So they wouldn't have had to do this probable cause affidavit if they had already presented and they had an indictment, they would just unsealed it. I don't, I think that's a far fetch. I don't think they were ready. And you look at Jack's comments Jack's comments is because they were fleeing, it made them go faster than they wanted to. That would be consistent with the grand jury meeting on Wednesday and probably presenting it on Wednesday. That's my guess. Uh, Ryan from Sally Williams. Ryan, do you think Donna's husband is involved? My own dear mother has said from day one, she thinks he's complicit. What do you think? <laughs> I think that it's hard to say um, that he didn't know. Um, I think it's similar to what Tim was saying earlier. Is there enough evidence to convict him? Because if we were to convict people on emotions, this thing would have been done 10 years ago. Uh, if we thought, you know, based upon what we think. But can you prove it? Can you prove when you did it? I don't think so. Um, but that family sure did talk a lot. And Donna looks like she had a lot to say. So they've been together a long time. So it's hard to believe that he didn't know about this. Ryan, were you ever over at their apartment at the icon in South beach? Yes. Wow. So take me, take, take me in there. I mean, just take me, I don't know. Were you there for lunch? Were you there for dinner? T just tell me what, I, what, what was Donna good. like? How did she greet you? What was the family setting? Like they were very, they were nice. They were your normal South Florida, highly successful family. Uh, so that's why a lot of this, you know, the whole time, like I said earlier, about getting criticized about still hanging out with Charlie. Well, you know, these are people that, you know, did you really, I mean, it, it was just hard to make an opinion, um, but it, they didn't seem like they were capable of doing any of this, but after reading a lot of the emails and things and that you guys presented, I think you did today that Georgia was uh, reading off. Good God. You know, I mean, it's, it's scary. It's disgusting. The, the pressure that Donna was placing on Wendy and possibly Charlie and the phone calls. And I mean, it's, I, I didn't experience that. I wasn't on three way. I wasn't reading her emails. So, you know, to, they come across as just a, you know, very intelligent and, and successful South Florida family. And they were living the dream until they Ryan, created a nightmare. 
Yeah, this is a tough comment, but we uh, we don't shy away from the tough. So I'm going to put this up for you. You're a tough guy. You can handle it. I'm just curious to see how you respond to this from Gabriella talking about you. He needs to go away. He did not cut his friendship off when he knew until he was affected by unrelated BS is when he parted ways with psychopath Charlie Ryan Fitzgerald is interested. Patrick does not deserve the platform. Um, we hear all sides here on STS. I'm a former broadcast journalist. I'm willing to listen to all sides. But your response to this, um, did you know, um, did you ever raise the issue? And if so, why, you know, why didn't you either call authorities? Why didn't you do something? Why didn't you confront Charlie? Maybe you did. I don't know. I'm not a law enforcement officer. I'm not a practicing prosecuting attorney. I'm not a mind reader. I have my opinions, just like I made my last statement based upon emotions. If we thought there were emotions involved, I guess you could have convicted them. They say a lot of people made a lot of comments about my stealing of $2 million. Well, I'm still looking in my couch for that, Joel. The the, the 500000 that Charlie said I stole. My mom texted me after I testified. She's like, are you holding out? <laughs> because none of this is true. And that's why the state of Florida and probably it was in Palm Beach County, Mr. Ehrenberg probably dismissed the case because it was such irrelevant and uh, just frivolous, litigious BS or whatever. So... A lot of people are going to have a lot of their opinions and we know what that is like, but you know, they're, they're welcome to have that. And uh, I think that coming forward was something that I was a required by law to do and B I have no problem doing to help, you know, seek justice and tell the story. So people have a better idea of what was going on behind the scenes a little bit. And I'm not getting paid from this. Like I, I haven't received a paycheck. I'm very um, impressed by Tim's coverage and Joel's coverage and, it's nice to have the other two panel members on here and allow me to speak. Uh, I'm not looking for fame. I'm not looking for fortune. Um, it's just an opportunity. To, I, I become educated every day. I listen to you and uh, Tim, Joel. So I'm interested. And in if I have a an angle that can help shine some light on something where people can say, what was going on with these people? That's all I'm trying to do. I mean, I, you know. And I think, I think <laughs> I honestly, I think that's <laughs> – I think it's invaluable to see how these people were. Now, I come from a totally uh, lovely background. Uh, love my parent. My father just passed. My mother is my dear mother. Not dysfunctional at all. How was the relationship between Charlie and Donna? Did you find it strange in any way? No, not at all. I mean, it. like I said, uh, at Judy's uh, podcast that she had me on last week, I, I talked to my mother a lot, too, so... I'm the youngest of the family, and I don't find that abnormal as well. But uh, maybe it was. But like I said, I wasn't on the phone, Joel, so I wasn't reading the emails. You know, I, I, I just thought it was normal. I just thought they just had a good relationship, maybe too good. At, at this point, we're starting to realize. But <laughs> Tim Jansen, by the way, I always noticed Donna spoke very softly to Charlie and called him doll or baby doll. Um, no. But Tom, uh, Tim Jansen, not Tom Jansen, Tim Jansen from Linda. Uh, could Don, this is an interesting question. Could Donna have escaped if she had hired a private plane? If she flew from Opelaka, which is a private airport here, would she have been able to make a run for it, do you think? Probably, because I think what happened was she was on a no-fly list or a detained fly list. They got wind of it or they got wind of the phone calls. And then after the phone calls, they checked the flight list. And then they found out she, her and Harvey were flying, and that's when they jumped into action. Um, a private jet could have, obviously they could have, unless they were tracking her. She could have gone to a private airport, got a plane, and flown private. Should have done it like two weeks ago, though. I was yeah. thinking the same thing. I mean, they had all the money in the world. I mean, mm. what did they take? Yeah, Jack would have arrested her prior to the verdict in Charlie. They were waiting to see what was going to happen with Charlie. So I doubt he would have arrested her. So By the way, have... when you're a, when you're a news reporter in Miami, I did a story about a dog, a dog. And I love dogs, but the dog flew private out of Opelaka. Um, that was an interesting story. I had to go on the plane and interview that dog. And he looked at me like I was crazy, like most dogs do when I interview them. Uh, Terry Austin, some interesting questions were brought up by STS Nation via tweet. One of them, and I know you're not a family attorney. I don't think you are, but. What does all this mean, they wanted to know, for the visitation of the kids? Because now you've got an uncle who's a convicted killer. 
You have a grandmother who is in custody. Um, I, I, to be perfectly honest, don't know the child services um, acronym right now. So I'm not thinking right in the state of Florida, but is it possible? I mean, the mother, obviously, Wendy is still around, but is it possible that the state can step in here in any way? Well, unless they find something against Wendy, she has a right to have her sons with her. I mean, her husband, Dan, is gone. You know, whether she's responsible for it or not, we may never know. Charlie's in jail. Donna and Harvey were the ones as grandparents who really, especially Donna, was pushing to make sure she could see the boys. And now she's in jail. And as we said earlier, she will probably not get out of jail. Uh, she probably will pass away based on her age in jail. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that leaves the mom and she probably will have her sons unless they can bring some charges against her. And we've discussed this. I mean, I don't think they are going to be able to bring anything against her. I mean, it could very well be they have some independent evidence or, you know, maybe they decide to go after her for perjury. But I think for now, she is probably sitting fairly safe and will probably keep her kids. Now, you know, if someone were to raise an issue with another family member, let's say someone in the Markell family, perhaps, you know, Ruth could raise that in, in regards to Ruth. We interviewed her for law and crime. And, um, you know, my regards go out to the entire Markell family, but they could raise the issue and it could get before the courts. And, you know, we, we don't know if that will happen, but there could be some claim that the children aren't safe with Wendy, but I think it will be very difficult to take custody away from her. So for now, I think the boys will probably uh, stay in her custody. Uh, Ferrucci Napoli or Napoli. Tim, do you think Donna can pull an El Chapo escape from prison? Tim Jansen, will the helicopters come in and rappel down off those helicopters to save her? Donna's going nowhere but the Leon County Jail. <laughs> then she's going to state prison. <laughs> then she's going to meet her maker. Do mm. not pass go. <laughs> do not pass go. Lisa with the super sticker and then tennis girl here. I'm so grateful Ryan is talking to us. Seems like a straight up kind of guy. I like Ryan's vibe. Uh, don't come at me with hate. I'm a good. I'm a good uh, read of people. I think uh, Ryan has nothing to really gain from speaking, and uh, I think he's a straight up talker. Uh, Joel, if I could just add to that, I definitely yeah. think Ryan's testimony during the case for you know against Charlie Adelson was very helpful during the closing arguments by Georgia Koppelman, she talked about how Charlie's demeanor changed and how prior to the arrest of Katie McBanawa, he was fine. He didn't have any problems. You know, he's talking about he's being extorted. He, he was cool, calm and collected. It wasn't until the pieces started to fall and people started to get, you know, arrested and convicted that his whole demeanor changed. And I think, Ryan, to your credit, you know, giving the testimony that you did as far as that was concerned, I think definitely um, helped. So, you know, you Thank can't you. tell what people are like. Um, you know, you believe what you're seeing and it's not until obviously that the true colors come out. So I, I applaud you for coming to testify. And, and, you know, like one of the viewers said, um, there's no hate here. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate yeah, it. Ryan, I mean, you know him better than anyone. He's sitting in state prison. I mean, he looked terrible at the trial. Ooh. He just looked like, you know, he was a ghost. But how do you think mentally he's handling this? In his head, he's saying no more millions, no more money, no more women. Um, he has a son. A lot of people don't know that. Um, did he ever hang out with this son? I mean, he was so young. It wasn't like we had we reacted and had a relationship, but I've been around him a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how Charlie's going to do it. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't have a, a 10th of the items and money and opportunities that he had necessarily to entertain himself and live. I mean, I, I just can't fathom this whole, why someone would do this. I, I just really can't wrap my brain around it. So Did yeah, this person wants to know if you ever met Rob Adelson, the estranged son. I'm assuming you didn't because he wasn't part of the family. But uh, No, I don't know anybody that has either. I mean, 
maybe he knew something that we didn't know, you know, like obviously he didn't want any part of anything. I was kind of interested to see him. He was on, uh, I don't know if it was state's witness list or if it was defense counsel, but I was kind of interested to, to see him. I mean, I've heard he's a brilliant doctor and uh, obviously smart enough to get away from these wackadoos. So. Hmm. And look at this question from Monique Dawn, um, Ryan. What is Wendy telling her sons about Grandma Adelson? You're the only one that's been to their apartment. If you had a guest tonight, what do you think she is saying about where Grandma is? She gone. <laughs> she, no mas. She, she gone. gone. Adios. I don't know. I vowed adios. I don't know what to say. That's an interesting question. I wish I had an insightful, intelligent answer, but. It is what it is. Yeah, and I, I don't mean to laugh at that because listen, I've come yeah. come very close with Ruth, Shelley, and Phil, and I got to say, Phil is a stand up guy. Dan's father is a fantastic guy, as is his sister Shelley, and Ruth is wonderful. Um, and they're all just being. I mean, this is just this is torture. Um, and it's been torture for nine plus years. The kids are at the center of it. Um, I want to get to this question in a minute, but Jeremy. Um, I had an attorney write in to me. Uh, her name is Brandy Elliott. And she says, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about why the only motive the state focused on was the relocation. I believe that was a motivating factor. But closer into, in time, closer in time to the murder was Dan's motion that alleged Wendy had concealed assets in their divorce proceeding. Um, was money also a big motive here, do you think? that Wendy was hiding money? Well, I think that's a good point. And I think the state brought that out in the trial. I'm not sure that they highlighted that as much as the relocation and the contempt motion and trying to require a supervisor for uh, Donna having contact with the boys, but it, it was brought out with the, uh, the state's case in chief, but I do think it's important. I mean, I think these are people that threw money around uh, money, this beautiful life was was very important to them. They thought they could pull strings and make things happen. So I think the fact that, uh, uh, number one, that Wendy would be hiding money, allegedly, and then number two, that he's going to, you know, potentially go after her in a, in a way that, you know, bar complaints can be made and things like that. I, I do. I do think it could have been uh, part of this. And hey, Joel, I think the defense, Kristen Adamson got up there and testified they're talking, it was, I think it was like $50,000. And what it was, it was a non-marital asset, which, which she had special equity in, which she owned before the marriage. So Kristen said they felt comfortable. They weren't hiding assets. It was a non-marital asset. I think the two things were grandmother not being have independent visits yep. and the relocation. Because remember, he was she was saying that he was stupid. That really pissed him off. And that they filed a motion that she would not be able to be alone with the children unsupervised. Those and the relocation were the two motivating issues, I believe. Yeah, yeah she, I, she did keep, I'm sorry to interrupt, she did keep the uh, grandmother's diamond ring or something from the, the Holocaust, Holocaust diamond. Ring, yeah. Which, I mean, that would have to hit pretty close to home, I imagine, as well. That's just a spiteful thing to do. The money yeah, can be made, that can never be replaced. That That's a great point. That is. All spite. That's uh, an heirloom that was never returned, a Holocaust diamond. Uh, Megan here uh, to you, Terry. Who's protecting the children? The father is no longer here. Mom can't be in a good state of mind. Uncle's in prison. Grandma's in jail. There has to be some kind of protection for them. We just touched on it, but how would you respond to Megan here? Well, I mean, we don't know what Wendy's state of mind is right now. I mean, she testified. She seemed fine on the stand. I'm sure she's providing for the children, making sure they go to school, making sure they get three meals a day. I mean, if we see some evidence that she's not taking good care of the kids, then of course the state can move in. I mean, she probably has the support of her friends. Obviously, most of the family now is gone, but she will take care of them the way she's been taking care of them. It is interesting to recognize the fact that Wendy's whole life she has been protected. And it's a very good question by your viewer, Joel. It's the whole lifetime of Wendy is if she can't take care of herself. I mean, Charlie was always responsible for her. Donna was always asking Charlie to check in on her. So I, it, it's a very good question. And 
you know, I, I'm hoping that her motherly instincts will kick in and that she will provide for the children. And if not, she'll get the backup that she needs from other family members who we don't know about or her friends to help support her through this. It's got to be an extremely difficult time. I mean, obviously, we've seen all of these people be convicted for the murder of Dan Markell. But if you think about what Wendy's going through, what her children are going through, it's very difficult. I'm certain of that. A couple more questions, and then we will get final thoughts. Sandra Johnson here. Um, This 70th birthday party throughout Charlie's trial kind of became code for the birthday gift, which was the murder of Dan Markell. They want to know, were you at Harvey's 70th birthday bash, Ryan Fitzpatrick? No, I was not. You were not. I was at other parties with him, but not the 70th birthday. Uh, Ryan, give me a Charlie story, just off the top of your head. If you had a, I don't know, tell Charlie in a story, give me one. Oh gosh! <laughs> and, and try not to get that, me try not to get me demonetized in the process. But go no, ahead. No, I mean in a lot. I, I, blind is a bad. I didn't put my glass on. I'm trying to read my TV on some of the comments. I went on. I was in the Philippines with Charlie. I was all over the world with Charlie. I've been in Colombia with Charlie. Uh, Costa Rica, Vegas. It's funny. One of the uh, initial complaints. I think it was Wendy's boyfriend that filed the initial complaint against me. It was 177 pages filed in Palm Beach County courts and they included like all these pictures of myself in Vegas at a pool party but I don't think they realized Charlie was with me so if if you're gonna damn me for being in Vegas like I stole his money he was there so uh I don't know Charlie was a jokester that's why I don't think he'll farewell in jail I think he'll say something that he thinks is funny that someone's just not gonna say uh think the same you know but uh we heard all, like we heard all this talk about how he talks too much and this whole joke about the TV repairman. He's like, I tell a lot of bad jokes. Um, I mean, is he is he a likable guy? Like when you're hanging out with a bunch of dudes, are they like, yeah, this is a good guy? I mean, or is he does he stand out in the crowd as being obnoxious? No, I wouldn't call him obnoxious. I'd say he's funny, kind of a goofball, kind of a jokester. Um you know, he was the maestro, which sounds makes him look like a buffoon now. But uh, he was fun. I mean, it, that's that's why people in the interweb world that doesn't understand we we always had a good time. Um, you know, we didn't sit around to talk about Dan Markell, you know, someone who I had never met, and there wasn't the media coverage on this uh, that there is now. I mean, it's overwhelming coverage. Um, I talked to a woman at the post office today at. 3 p.m. I was dropping off a package that had heard about Donna getting arrested today. Uh, there was a woman when I got home from the trial that Saturday morning at 3 a.m. from the Fort Lauderdale airport. There was a person in uh, the 7-Eleven working that th- they knew about the case. So, I mean, back when this occurred, I mean, you're talking 2014 to 2016, there was no real media coverage. I mean, it might have been a short little two-minute blast on – Tallahassee, WCTV in Tallahassee or something, but about the murder, but it wasn't any suspects or any people that, you know, that they were eyeballing or anything. So it just started really unraveling after about 2016. And uh, there's the old saying, loose lips sink ships. And someone wanted to know if the Adelsons had a penchant with the family drink a little too much wine sometimes. You think that's one of the reasons they're always on these wiretaps talking away? Uh, I don't really know about their drinking habits. I know Charlie really wasn't a big drinker. Um, he liked to, uh, partake in other things, but it wasn't a big drinker by any means, you know? Um, so I can't comment on that. I don't know. Okay. Thank you to whoever that someone gave us a nice super sticker. Appreciate that. Um, let's get our final thoughts on this here about who rolls on who. We'll start with Terry from Emily Wines app. What are the chances Terry, that Donna just rolls over and pleads guilty. She doesn't look like she has a lot of fight left, especially after Charlie's conviction. Do you think she's just going to be a lamb here and uh, give herself up for slaughter? Well, she definitely looks like she doesn't have a lot of fight left. So I agree with that. I think, however, her entire life, she has been this mastermind. She's been the strength behind the family. If she can pull herself together, I think she'll fight it. If I had to say today, right now, would she be able to take a plea? Would they give her something less? I think she might try to go for that. I don't think she 
has a lot of fight in her based on her appearance that we saw when she was in the turtle suit. She looked as though, I can't believe I'm here. I just want to go home. And I don't think they're going to let her go home. I think she's going to remain behind bars. I don't think they want to give her any sort of plea that will get her out of jail. Her age is going to work to her advantage. But at the end of the day, I think we're going to see her in jail. I don't think going to accept a plea from her. And I don't think she's going to roll over on Harvey or anybody else. I think there's not enough on Harvey anyway. And I think she'll go down and she'll probably go down alone. And Wendy will probably stay with her sons. And maybe that'll be the last of it. The final thought I wanted to give about Georgia Koppelman, great job. Kudos to her for one at a time knocking these off. I don't know if anybody else could have done it the way she did it. And people might have criticized the way she did the cross-examination, but I think she allowed Charlie Adelson to dig his own hole the way the prosecution did in the Alec Murdoch case. And I think it worked to her advantage and she got the job done. Hmm. Jeremy Mutz, um, if anyone rolls on anyone, what in your opinion is the most likely scenario? Uh, my personal one would be that Charlie probably flips on Wendy. Um, Seems like they, they are at odds with each. What's that? <laughs> She's flipped on him like three times already. I mean, she was twenty minutes into a police interrogation the day of the murder and told on him. So sorry 100%. to interrupt you. But, I mean, did, did he ever uh, talk to you about? Did he ever talk to you about being resentful towards Wendy? Did he ever mention that? No, we didn't talk about it. We didn't talk about it. Um, I mean, so I, Jeremy, I, yeah, yeah go sorry. ahead. No, uh, let me just get Jeremy here on this and I'll come to you and then we will reserve the final word for the famed Tallahassee defense attorney, Tim Jansen. Uh, Jeremy Mutz, what do you think is the most likely scenario if someone's going to flip on somebody in this situation? Well, I wonder if Wendy's sort of implication of Charlie wasn't just a strategy to kind of give them just enough to show I'm being truthful. I'm, I'm cooperating. I'm giving you all this. So I think that that could have been more of that. I just don't see any of them uh, ratting out the others. I think Donna might be interested in a plea if she could save Harvey and Wendy. I don't know that the state would make such a deal, but uh, this case would not be quite as strong as Charlie's. I think it, I think Charlie's was stronger than than Donna's, although Donna's certainly you know quite strong. Would the state take twenty years uh, in exchange for not prosecuting Wendy and Harvey, who they're probably not going to prosecute anybody? Uh, that's possible, probably unlikely, but but possible. I think more possible than Charlie or any of them, you know, implicating their remaining family members. What do you think about the in Wendy's testimony? I think in the first couple of questions, uh, Georgia asked her about her knowledge of this extortion that went on for nine and a half years, and she said today was the first day that she had learned about it. I mean. As much as they talk to each other, Jeremy, it's hard to believe that. It, it that is. And I think it's, again, maybe their arrogance that they thought that they could just play this in front of the jury and the jury would just swallow it. Um, but no, that that hurt her testimony, I think. And I think Georgia devastated her, you know, toward the end of cross. Oh, yeah. um, that point yeah. and others. Ryan, someone wanted to know, uh, what were you doing on all those uh, worldly trips with Charlie Adelson? Were you guys uh, going to bars, hanging out, picking up women? What was going on? I'm sorry. I'm breaking up. Yeah. Bad question. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Can't hear you, got, Joel. Ryan, who got more women, you or Charlie? You're a better looking. I think you're a better looking oh, dude. Man. The maestro. Give it to the maestro. The maestro. Money the man. Man. The money and, man. And, yeah. Ryan, take me into tell. Just take me into Charlie's house. What was the house like? What was the atmosphere in that house like when you would go over there? He had a really, really, really nice backyard and a really nice pool. But his house looked I, – I would have never – could never live in there. It was – it was, it was a, like a split level, Fort Lauderdale, off Riverland, you know, and it, it just was looked like something of – like a college house I would have lived in or something. Mm. Interesting. He didn't spend money on it. Was, he would go buy Ferraris and Porsches, but he, you know, he would wear a black V-neck shirt, old jeans, and the furniture wasn't anything nice or anything. I mean, a really nice pool and hot tub or whatever, but it was it wasn't nice by any means. 
That's, that sounds like a lot of Miami living. You see uh, Ferraris parked in front of like split level condos. So uh, right. there you go. Um, it's always the guys driving the uh, Toyota Camry that are really rolling in the money, not the guys in the maestro, the Ferrari, the maestro plate. Um, Jewel, five dollars super sticker. Who needs mainstream news when we have the wonderful Joel and the super panel guests? Love from the UK. Very well said. I would have to agree with you. Um, Annalise from New Zealand. Tim, what would you say to Dan's parents after this news, given that they have just been at Charlie's trial? Um, what would you say to them now that they know that Donna is also in custody? Well, I was concerned last night because when we tried to reach out to Ruth to find out if they had heard that Donna had been arrested, I don't think Ruth had, did she, Joel? Uh, she had not, as far as yeah. I know. And and, and that, that troubles me because a victim witness coordinator should make sure that they know before they see it on any media. You'd think they want to let them know. Uh, of that's, that's an important detail on an important event. Um, what do you say to a victim's parents? A victim can never come back. This whole crime should have never been committed. Um, it's horrendous to these grandkids. How many lives have been affected by this because Donna wanted to have her baby kids near her. So instead of getting a divorce or whatever, she commits a murder. No one should feel sorry for any of these people. 73, she shouldn't get sympathy. She orchestrated this crime. She covered it up for years. After the bump, she was covering up. They were talking in code and she tries to flee. So why should she get any sympathy at all? She shouldn't. And Charlie, he thought he was going to get away with it. He didn't. So we don't have sympathy. The justice system doesn't have sympathy. You commit a crime, the state's going to prosecute you. You get a lawyer, you can fight the charges. She made the biggest mistake. She had a better case than Charlie. But the fleeing and the conversation at the jail, she has zero chance of winning at trial. They're not going to offer her a deal because they don't need to. Georgia could try this case in her sleep. She's got all the evidence, all the witnesses. She's got transcripts. She doesn't, she doesn't need much to prepare. All she's got to do is interweave the flight. And, and, and that's what she'll say to the defense lawyer. And whoever defense, what, what do you want to plead? What do you got? You got nothing. So why should I give you some? You give me Wendy. You give me Harvey. We'll talk. <laughs> Hmm. How, long uh, Doc, to take, just huh? the, how long do you think it's going to take to go to trial? Just the preparation for defense? It depends who the defense lawyer is. Um, if, if it's rash bomb, he should be ready to go. But I don't know if you want to do that again. That didn't work out so well. You know, what's the saying? You keep doing the same thing. You expect a different result. Mm -hmm. um, and if they have all this money that they can money offshore, they could hire good lawyers, reasonable lawyers. And maybe they're not going to get a not guilty. Maybe they're going to hire him just to get a, get a resolution, a plea. That happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Doc Bailey, membership worth the money so far. Doc, if you find a show with better guests, let me know. <laughs> I'll give you your money back. It ain't happening. We got the best guests in true crime consistently. That's thanks to Steve Cohen. I am not T-Pain. Already made a meme of Donna Adelson crab walking. Look at this. Look oh, at this. Yeah. That is Donna crab walking. <laughs> oh I'm not T-Pain. Immediately email that to me. I'm putting it on Insta and Twitter. There it is. This is why the internet always wins. Thank God I'm in my 50s. And uh, unfortunately, my kids are going to have to deal with this nonsense the rest of their life. Um, I'm too old for that. But it is hilarious. And uh, you got to send me that T-Pain. Um, someone... In the comments, I lost it because of that, said that there is no doubt that Ryan Fitzpatrick is much more handsome than Charlie Adelson. So uh, it's been decided Thank there, you. Ryan, and I would have to, I would have to second that. Um, huge thanks to our panel. Uh, Steve Cohen is the brains behind the operation. Tomorrow, he's already lining up another amazing panel. But tonight, uh, counterclockwise here. We've got Ryan Fitzpatrick, former best friend of Charlie Adelson, no longer. Any plans, Ryan, to ever, um, I don't know, to ever mend the relationship, go visit him in state prison? Would you ever do that? You're never going to talk to this guy again, are you? No, absolutely not. As I didn't even mom, like seeing him in court. It kind of made me sick. 
Mm. My mom wouldn't want me to say this, but my mom would say he's dead to me. That's Carmela's ruthless. So uh, I guess that's the case here. Terry Austin, she is a uh, Columbia Law School grad, smart and uh, kind for coming on our show. Uh, Terry, any final thoughts here tonight? Thank you for having me. I think it's been a wonderful panel. Can't wait to see what else Georgia Koppelman has to do. And, uh, you know, my thoughts go out to the Markel family. Jeremy Mutz, he is an attorney now in private practice. He was inside the state attorney's office in Tallahassee. Jeremy, your final thought as we say goodbye tonight. I'm honored to be with all of you. And uh, we're at the final steps here. You know, back when this first started happening, you know, we're all kind of in, in this as a mystery, not knowing what happened. And then we kind of get an idea. It's the family that pulled the strings. And we all wanted to see that then brought to justice. And I'm glad that we're at this point now. Jeremy, the name of your two books that are already published so people can go out and buy them. Well, thank you, Joel. The Chance I'll Take and Don't Call It Murder. They're both on Amazon, paperback and Kindle. He's not only a smart attorney, the guy's a good author, support authors. I got my book coming out Father's Day. I took pictures with Carm today for the book cover. Ryan Fitzpatrick's going to help me sell this. He's going to be our tour manager. <laughs> going to be our security. He's going to be our body guy when we're all over the place. Um, oh, man, I am tired tonight. Cavi My mom's screaming. Don't say you're tired. Um, Caviana, is there a chance, Tim Jansen, final question to you, that Georgia purposely didn't ask Wendy certain questions during questioning to potentially be able to indict her later? And your final thoughts, Tim? I think that would have been a prudent move on her part. I think she probably did. But at some point, you have to remember, Georgia made a choice. Georgia decided who she was going to subpoena and give immunity to. And she chose Wendy. Why did she choose Wendy? Probably because she didn't think she had enough to charge her. And listening to the tapes, there was some exculpatory or what we call Brady material favorable to her that she felt she was the least one she could prosecute other than Harvey. So... Um, I'm sure she did limit the questions, but I think she made a decision early on. She was going to go after the others first. And maybe that's the only others they're going to get. But all the panel, all the, all the viewers are going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm representing Wendy. I'm happy for the Adelsons. You just heard my comment about Donna. She should be prosecuted vigorously for what she did. I just don't think there's enough evidence against Wendy. Mm. Um, well, I'll tell you this. Every time I think about Charlie and now Donna behind bars, especially Donna, Same my palms you. literally sweat. It is a nightmarish right. thought. Uh, they are trapped there, and soon they'll both be in Tallahassee, which is the irony of all ironies. Um, last but not least here from Lori Barrett, Tim Jansen is uh, stretching those ribs with a Windsor behind him. For those who do hey, not yeah. know, Tim Jansen is the MVP. He broke some ribs, which was – Horrible for him and great for me because he was able to do commentary throughout this entire trial. But now I want those ribs to heal up. Lori Barrett, Joel, have you spoken to the Markell family? Did I miss you say that? I hope they're feeling some relief. I have uh, been in contact with Shelly, Phil, and Ruth. They are, I think, overwhelmed with emotion. So grateful to the community um, at large supporting them. It's been a long time coming, and they're finally getting some justice there is more justice to be had. So they are uh, awaiting on that. Um, but at the center of this are those two young boys, obviously their son, Dan Markell, and you've got Charlie's son. So it is a tragic story. Let's keep that in mind until tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Love you, America. Love you, you. Tallahassee. Thank you. Thank you all.